Hi, everyone. Welcome to episode six of the Future of Work show. And today's topic is one which is so interesting and somewhat mysterious to me, the art of storytelling. So let me, in fact, begin with a story that all of us know and have heard many, many times in our lives. The story of a king in a faraway kingdom a long, long time ago. Now, this king had been betrayed by his wife and he'd had her executed. But the matters didn't end there. He had developed such a hatred for future wives and women that he would marry a young bride and spend the night with her and have her executed the next morning. So this went on and on till all the young brides in the country had been executed. And no one knew what to do next. So the prime minister's daughter offered to be the next bride. And she told her dad that she had a ruse that would help her through this extremely complicated situation. So as we all know in the story, every evening she sits with the king and she starts off a story, which is so interesting, but then she doesn't quite end it. She leaves the story at a very interesting place. And then the king cannot have her executed the next morning. So he needs to hear the rest of the story and brings her back in. And so on, it goes on for a thousand nights. By the end of it, the king realizes that his plan was actually very cruel and foolish. And she lives for as his queen forever. At least that's what the story says. So that's really the power of stories. Uh, the power to give people life and sometimes otherwise. So to understand some of what gives stories their power, I have with me two amazing storytellers, uh, Amin and Ravi. Hi, Amin. Hi, Ravi. Welcome to the show. Hi, Hi. Shalini. Hi. Hello. So, Hi. As some of you might know, uh, Amin is the founder of uh, Storywalas. He's been in working as a storyteller in some form or the other for about two decades. He has a background in advertising and theater. And we're going to ask a little bit about his motivations to start Storywalas just a little bit later. Ravi is a graduate from I'm Ahmedabad, and he's worked in fields like consulting as an entrepreneur, before starting off as a storyteller coach. And now he works with many businesses, many leaders to help them tell their stories better. So thank you, Amin. Thank you, Ravi. So happy to have you join us today. So one of the thank things you so I must, much. <laughs> thank you. Uh, one of the things I must tell both of you that when I was going through your website and your LinkedIn page, both of you have given me some very quotable quotes. So Ravi, I loved what you said about if data is the new oil, storytelling is the new refinery. I mean, that's supremely quotable. And Amin, I love what you say about those who tell great stories have great stories. Is that what you say? Yeah, it's Ira Glass actually who says this, that great stories happen to those who can tell them. And Ira Glass is an uh, NPR radio chat show host. And I just love it. And uh, very powerful, uh, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So one of the questions I've had for a long time, and I'm obviously no storyteller at all, is just how storytelling has suddenly come to the forefront. And, uh, you know, say a decade ago, people may have looked at even the term storyteller with a little bit of, uh, you know, with a little bit of questioning that what is this job? What does one even do as a storyteller? How is that connected to business? But we've seen such a change over the last uh, maybe five or seven years where uh, people like both of you and uh, actually many, many others. Today, it's really not uncommon to find people write storyteller right in their LinkedIn you know, headline. So the field of storytelling and as it connects to business and leadership seems to have really exploded. And that's really my first question. I'd love to understand from both of you your thoughts around you know, what really is happening that's led to some of this uh, prominence for storytelling. Ravi, why don't you go first? Yeah. OK. <laughs> Thank you, Amin. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, I think the skill has always been of importance, Shalini. So we've been storytellers since millennia, right? When we 
when mankind discovered fire then we would sit around the fire and exchange stories with each other and most of the stories had information that was critical for survival so people learned that you know hey i need to remember these stories so stories are, have been used for a long time i think what's happened over the last let's say 5 7 10 years or so are a few factors that have increased the importance of the skill for uh, business people for leaders and managers i think one is uh, this explosion of data that we have seen uh, so i remember this conversation with a media company i was working with them to improve their storytelling skills and they were saying that you know earlier uh, during the days of cable tv we used to get data about tv viewing habits like once a week there should be this tam data they have this meter that's kept in a few households i think 1500 households or something and it's sample data and that's what they would get and they would you know that's their world and they would work with that and make sense of that and whatever now with with the netflixization of of viewing mm -hmm. uh, that same company has uh, has an online uh, you know uh, streaming platform also and there they are getting second by second data what happens after the 15th second you know how where does attention drop off where do people switch so imagine the explosion it's not a you know 5 10% increase it's an order of magnitude increase in the amount of data that is going to come and that is hitting all of us and so if you having such amount of data that's great that means more insights more stuff hidden there more stuff that you can use to improve your business improve the offering to your customers but you have to make sense of that so which is where i think the skill becomes more important the refining skill of you know converting that crude oil into into the petroleum that uh, storytelling skill i think that's one big change that has happened i would say another big change that's happened uh, is you know with the attack of these devices and apps and you know, so many notifications that we keep getting all the time our attention spans have taken a hit it was not as if they were great earlier but now i think it's even worse it's it's really shortening mm -hmm. and so a lot of people love to quote that you know crazy number by the study by microsoft in canada where they try to you know actually measure what's the average human attention span and uh, you might think okay 5 minutes 10 minutes or whatever that study came up with a number of 8 seconds and so you might dispute that number but the point is attention spans are low and falling and i think these two have had an impact of you know the onus of the person communicating is really high to communicate well and to tell a good story uh, with the data explosion and the lowering attention span so for me i think those two are two big reasons why i think storytelling has taken off as it rightly should over the last 5 6 7 years i mean what do you think i completely agree with ravi uh, and every point that he's made it's absolutely bang on uh, data explosion leading to uh, attention deficit syndrome leading to the need to simplify uh, leading to uh, people who can simplify becoming very important uh, now when i say simplify it's not an easy skill it requires pattern recognition being able to read a pattern being able to communicate with metaphors analogies uh, it's not easy uh, but is it a is it a learnable skill of course it's a learnable skill you know as humans we are all born storytellers at some level we are born with that ability but ability is like a knife if you don't use it it gets rusted uh, it's like languages if you don't use a language you know you struggle with that language so like yuval noah harari says uh, in his book uh, sapiens we are born storytellers we have the ability as a species to imagine an alternate world that does not exist that gift of imagination is something that we are born with we can create an alternate world and an alternate reality uh, and live in that reality and invest in that reality emotionally so we've we've always been like that for thousands of years millions of years we've been sitting around fires and not making powerpoint we've been sitting around fires and telling stories to each other uh, but what happens is when data increases, like Ravi was saying, every powerful trend leads to a counter trend. Just yep. like use of, use of a lot of uh, machinery and use of a lot of uh, digital technologies and creating music has made us crave for unplugged and raw music where people sit around a fire and, and play without any digital uh, amplification. Uh, something like MTV Unplugged or Closer to Coke Studio. Why do we crave for that experience? Because it's raw, but it's it's real. It's authentic. 
So let me ask you then, do you think that, you know, given that we're entering a future which is changing much more rapidly than anything any of us have really experienced in the past, um, and the fact that, as you said, there is both a data explosion and a sharp reduction in maybe attention spans, do you think this role of stories itself changes? Would you call it a future skill, as uh, you know, people like Dan Pink, et cetera, have done, that in the future, being able to tell good stories is going to be you know, one of the critical human and leadership skills? I wonder what you think about that. Well, look around you, uh, uh, <laughs> not just of the future, but uh, you know, of the past as well. Uh, you will see that great leaders have always been good storytellers. Uh, in fact, uh, it is one of the key skills that makes them a leader. Leader is about communicating a vision, inspiring people to follow that, buy into an idea. And uh, whether you look at uh, leadership at all levels, uh, when you look at leadership uh, at the political sphere, for example, uh, right from Gandhi to Nelson Mandela to Barack Obama, great storytellers. If you look at leadership at the spiritual level, uh, take Swami Vivekananda. He shook up the Western world with his articulation of Indian philosophy. Great storyteller. Uh, if you look at uh, leaders in the business uh, domain, you know, right from Steve Jobs to Richard Branson to Indra Nui, great storytellers. So you see that correlation, leadership storytelling, leadership storytelling, leadership storytelling, every sphere, writings on the wall. So see, this is so interesting. And I'm, you know, for instance, Ravi, you did an MBA, you went to business school, you know, I mean, you went to MICA, so at least you had some exposure to communication. But Ravi, you and I went to the same school. So, you yeah. know, I can say that that was never a central part of, uh, say, the MBA discipline. And cool. uh, I don't think uh, communication or, uh, or storytelling, I don't think it ever really entered any of our MBA curriculum, except for, I think, a couple of courses which we had around learning cool. from stories. Um, and you yourself, uh, Ravi, have had a career which uh, I think started off fairly uh, left brain. The whole, yeah. you know, you were a chartered accountant, yeah. uh, uh, you know, MBA, and then of course you worked with many of the consulting organizations. And then you made this transition at some point to storytelling and understanding the power of stories. How do you think all of this plays out? Like, what made you? switch and or not switch but broaden your understanding of leadership and business to include storytelling and other perhaps right brain sorry shani i can't hear you but you got the drift of that question Ravi. why don't you go and answer that uh, as to how, how did that happen uh, in your life from, you know, yeah, no, it's it's a it's a very uh, typical question, Shalini, and um, I think it's a bit of a misconception to you know kind of pigeonhole saying that okay, uh, CA MBA is all left brain, and storytelling is a right brain skill. I think a good storyteller needs to have a balance between uh, the left brain elements and the right brain elements. So it, there is a bit of a science and an art to the skill. And both are uh, equally important, I would say. So I love a great quote by Amin uh, in, in this whole field of storytelling. Right. So he, he has a simple three word definition of the word story, which is a good story is truth well told. Yeah. So the truth part is important. You can't, you know, make uh, mistakes with facts. You have to tell the facts, but you have to tell it well. So I, I think uh, the, the first part, one part of my life, which has been about, you know, accounting and finance and MBA and consulting has been about the truth part, you know, because truth can be complicated. It can be messy. It can be detailed. There are so many layers to the truth and you need to have the ability to, you know, dig, dig into that crude oil and find out that refinery, but you also have to tell it well. So I think there are other parts of my personality and unfortunately the world tries to, you know, typically there is a, okay, you're a CA, you're an MBA, you're this. But we all have multiple layers to our personality, right? So apart from being some of those labels, I, I've also been a closet writer. I used to write, uh, in fact, I very closely thought of going into the world of journalism when I was in my uh, graduation. But, you know, we don't have the courage and we, we follow the, the standard path. So that didn't happen. But I used to read, I used to read a lot of history. 
and so i think those layers were always there uh, within me and uh, i think at at the right time when it all just kind of came together when i realized that hey whether it is you know stuff with a balance sheet whether it is business data uh, or history the underlying principles of storytelling which is making facts interesting making it told well those principles are the same and so i became a huge fan of those uh, like a lifelong fan i am really like super happy to be in a place where i can you know actually spend uh, time understanding and learning them and then passing on that knowledge whatever limited i have to other folks and helping them improve their work outcomes so yeah it's it's been a great ride you know ravi what's so interesting is if we look at uh, all skill projections for the future you know yeah. so if you look at for instance world economic forums projections of what are going to be future skills uh, right from 2022 onwards uh you know there are things like creativity innovation creative problem solving uh and all of them are complex skills that use you know both our analytical you know thinking part of ourselves as well mm. as our creative and um you know the other side so i think it's really interesting that when we look at you know future of work and future skills uh all the ones that are likely to be in demand are layered they complex mm. they bring together elements of you know left brain logical thinking and right brain creative uh, creative work so it's really interesting that you discovered this as you went along and i, I mean, think we also need sorry 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 i just want to please please know, go ahead yeah. we also need uh, some defense against the machines right because that's the other big trend that's hitting us so we need to have some of these skills which are a mix uh, which hopefully yeah. the programmers can't uh, right. we will see about that no no but that's a really good point yeah. because actually when uh, you know whenever we speak about future of work at anq we work a lot with you know the intersection of future of work and people and organizations of business and technology one of the most popular questions and understandably because all of us are anxious about is you know what's going yeah. to happen to my job and if you look at all reports around skills needed for the future it's exactly that because simple mm. ones are so much easier easier to transfer to technology okay. the ones which are going to be in demand are the complex ones which aren't yeah. so simple and are bringing in very different elements together so you're absolutely right there i mean I was really interested in understanding your story. So you started off story while I was in 2012, well before storytelling became a thing. Would you share a little bit about, you know, what led you to go down that path? How did you realize you would be able to help businesses and organizations? A little bit of madness. Uh, a simple answer and uh, uh, delusion. Uh, that <laughs> that's what goes into <laughs> slightly being ahead of the curve but um, you know i shalini i as a kid i used to stammer a little bit as a result i was very shy and reserved and uh, an introvert kid please don't give me pathetic looks i had a very happy childhood uh, but uh, around grade 6th or 7th my mother who was a teacher she enrolled me into speech therapy and theater and elocution and debate competitions and poetry recitation and extracurricular activities and boy scouts and national cadet corps and i could go on but you get the gist a comprehensive damage control strategy to push me out of my comfort zone out there in the fun and i hated it uh, to be honest uh, mm -hmm. but when i look back now i am extremely grateful to my mother because uh, uh, speech therapy helped and theater helped my first role in theater was to play a dead body Uh, but it gave me a lot of it gave me a lot of confidence and uh, to be comfortable in front of audiences and i fell in love with uh, theater it became a large part of my life early enough in life uh, from high school i was doing a lot of theater in college i was doing a lot of theater so when i passed out of mica i joined ogilvy in mumbai i started working in advertising i had a day job which was uh, in advertising and i had an evening job which was in theater both are forms of storytelling in some ways so i was not you know story walas wasn't born but uh, i was doing storytelling i was working with theater and i was working with advertising now advertising is where uh, my work was as a communications planner and a lot of people think of advertising the stereotypical image is that uh, it's toothpaste advertising or uh, soap advertising but we were uh, you know you advertise anything 
right? You know, you advertise political campaigns and get people to buy into a political ideology or not buy into another political ideology. You get people to buy into uh, a savings bank account. When you open a bank, uh, people don't easily go and open, you know, bank accounts there. But your advertising has to persuade them into doing that. Uh, just to explain what I mean by that. Uh, when a restaurant opens in your neighborhood, you feel like going and eating there. When a bank opens in your neighborhood, you don't say, let me go and open an account. You don't want, you know, it, it, so how do you, how do you influence people through communication to buy into an idea? How do you build trust? How do you build, uh, how do you get people to open their wallet and vote with their money? And so that got me interested in behavioral economics in how people buy into ideas. And parallelly, I was doing theater and advertising and all of that. So in that, in the course of that work, I, I really got interested into how people buy into ideas. And there I found, you know, stories play this hugely powerful role. Uh, and I said, we don't leverage that power uh, outside of advertising. But leaders have always done that. Now, if that could be put into a process, if it could be taught as a teachable skill where people could learn that, that would be very useful. I also wanted to help teachers. So when I started the Story Wallas, you know, one of the desires was to help teachers become better storytellers. Uh, teachers become teachers by doing BA, MA, and one of these are really dated curriculums. And uh, what's missing there is uh, uh, storytelling. Now, if you think about your favorite subjects in school, it's very likely you'll remember your favorite teachers as well. And if you remember the teach subjects you didn't like, you'll remember the teachers you didn't like. Uh, so there's a strong correlation there. And storytelling can make any teacher, any subject interesting. So these were some of the motives uh, with which I started Storywalas uh, in uh, 2012. Uh, I had no idea it was going to become so big. And uh, uh, yeah, but these were some of the ideas that were there at the back of my head. I still remember my mom asking me, uh, and she has a healthy dose of sarcasm. So she asked me, uh, uh, she said, uh, Acha, I mean, so, you know, what are you going to do? You've quit your job. Uh, and she, you know, she's a Malayali and, you know, Malayali is, you know, they, their sarcasm and wit, you know, both are displayed uh, in an underhand way. So she said, so what is this storytelling that you're going to do? So I said, uh, you know, I'm going to tell stories to children. I'm going to tell, I'm going to teach people how to tell stories. Ah, nice, nice, nice. nice. Uh, are people going to pay you for that? <laughs> that was the second question. Are people going to pay you for that? So I hadn't started, so I had no way of knowing. So I said, I don't know. You know so my, I don't know. I will find out. Ah, yeah, of course, you don't know. You'll find out, of course. Actually, that's what I want to ask you. When you started out, you know, in 2012, and you went to presumably business leaders and said, let me help you tell better stories, really, did people even know what you were talking about. Yeah, that's, you know, you're right. So my mom, my mom, the third question that she asked is, are you mad? <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I've always believed that, uh, uh, you know, a little bit of madness, you know, Ravi is a madman. <laughs> I, <laughs> I know he's mad enough. So you know, the world has always made progress uh, thanks to mad people. When I say mad people, I mean passionate people. I use that yeah. word very respectfully. Uh, uh, you know, uh, in Hindi, there's a word called Zid. Uh, hmm. And, you know, the bulb happened because Einstein had Zid. Uh, Edison. You know, from a from a realistic lens, yeah. if you were to look at, you know, uh, an HR manager going to uh, uh, Edison and saying, hey, you know, can you tell me a little bit more about your uh, project, you know, 40 failed attempts? Can we have a, can we get in for a performance appraisal? You would never get a bulb yeah. like that. True. So you have to... You have to keep fear at bay and you have to uh, wade into the water and then only you can figure out this <laughs> thing. In retrospect, everything looks easy. Uh, thankfully for us, uh, uh, you know, clients came to us rather than us going out. It took a long time to build the practice like, uh, like it happens in anything which is early days and it was a slow build. Uh, a lot of learnings there, a lot of failures there. Uh, you learn from more from your failures than from your successes. Uh, and but I've been grateful for that journey and for the trust that clients have reposed. That sounds really amazing. And I completely agree with you. I think all progress happens with unreasonable people. It's the only way the world ever changes. 
<laughs> so Ravi, uh, I came across a LinkedIn post. Uh, I think you had uh, shared a few days ago after the antitrust hearings, the big tech yeah. antitrust hearings. And I was really fascinated by the criteria you had used to judge each of the leaders, business leaders, in their effectiveness of storytelling. So would you mind sharing a little bit about why? Firstly, why did you think this was even an important topic you know, to yeah. cover? Like, Why should their storytelling skills even matter? And second, sure. why you used the four criteria that you had? No, oh, yeah. Uh, thanks for that, Chandni. So I'm a big fan of... Um, good storytellers. And there are, of course, good storytellers from all walks of life. You know, Harsha Bokle is a fabulous storyteller when it comes to cricket. Shekhar Gupta is great at politics. Um, Malcolm Gladwell is brilliant when it comes to some of his, you know, nonfiction books. Uh, But in the world of business, uh, there are, of course, leaders. And then when you marry that with what I call as a high stakes story event, then there is story magic happening, right? Because uh, not all communication by leaders is critical. But there are these high stakes ones. And Steve Jobs was a master at that. So he would know that, okay, the iPhone launch is a once in a lifetime event. Let me let me put the best effort at that. Uh, now, all of these four, uh, it's not that, you know, every every year or every few years, you'll be tried by the US Congress and your your voice, your story, your words will be read and heard and interpreted by millions, if not billions around the world. So a lot of thought would go into these stories, right? So it's a uh, very senior leaders, uh, probably the, the tallest leader, leaders and business leaders in the world, and be very high stakes events. So that was what I think you know drew me to analyze that. Now, in terms of how to analyze that, I I basically try and break it down, and it's actually you know probably a little unnatural because many people probably just write, you know, they don't really think that oh okay, I'll, I'll first put a structure and then I'll do this. Although some people do that too, but many people just write from their heart, right? But for me, the idea is to try and see what can others learn. If others want to learn, how can we break it into these uh, smaller pieces and then say, okay, hey, this piece was very well done here versus this piece was not so well done here and so on. And when I try to do that, I try and look at a story as a like a layered cake uh, for, for food efficient. Right? It's a multi-level cake. And then you try and see, okay, what's the base of this cake? The base of this cake is like the story structure or a framework. So the broad uh, outline of the story that they're talking about. And then you keep adding the layers. So there's probably a human story layer there somewhere. You know, when people are talking about themselves, they are being vulnerable. You get to know them well, you probably trust them a little bit more. When people, instead of just reeling out statistics about the impact that they have had, when they are able to say, hey, this is a story of one person, one single mom living in rural Indiana who has benefited from our product, then that makes it more interesting. When people are adding layers of curiosity, of surprise, and so on. So there are a bunch of layers that are there. And then there, of course, if you are making a presentation, there is a visual layer because you have to kind of you know put it on slides. And finally, if you are actually talking through it, there's a delivery layer. So broadly, there's, you know, there's narrative, visuals, delivery. These are the three big ones. And then within that, there are these multiple parts of the, the storytelling cake. And so I, I'm, I just basically then try and break it down and then see, okay, oh, this one, I thought Bezos did a great job of telling his personal story. I didn't see any of that coming in, in Tim Cook's story and, and so on. So it's, it's, um, it's a little presumptuous of me to kind of, you know, go and make some of these uh, points, but I think it's, it's fun also. Yeah, so that's, that's the approach I used, Shalini. It was a really fascinating thing. And just remind me, there were four criteria, right? One was yeah. personal story, stakeholder story, then data yeah, story so, yeah so uh, broadly if you see there is uh, something about the data and then something about the human element of the story right so in the human element right. i kind of broke it into two parts one is your own story you know you are a leader but you're not amazon you're jeff bezos you're sundar pichai you know tell me about your story and sundar pichai did allude to it saying that you know when i grew up in he grew up in madurai in, in india uh, i didn't I, I didn't have access to a computer so when i went to a lab in the us the first time and i saw oh my god so many computers all available to me uh, you could almost sense that you know wonder in his in his tone although he had kind of toned it down a bit in the story but you could see that uh, and jeff bezos so went full ballistic it was brilliant you know his own uh, mom who used to sit in class was so driven uh, she was a teenage mom she used to have him by the side give him you know something to eat or drink and keep him occupied while she is learning and uh, such a wonderful story immediately makes him you know so human so likable 
and uh, so uh, both of them did that well then there was a stakeholder story which is you know you're telling you're making an impact on it. so many million employees so many million customers but can you tell me the story of one such person you know one real flesh and blood person you know who is that person why should i care about that person and so that was a second one which i thought you know a couple of them did well but the others didn't really bother too much uh, then there is a numbers and the data story and that is important you know ultimately your a lot of numbers are being leveled against you and this is your uh, you know platform to tell or tell your side of the story and talk about saying okay this is why i felt uh, we are really making a big impact and we are actually in a very competitive space and here are some numbers to back that up so this is also a place where uh, you kind of try to refute what i call as the anti story or the anti story which is what is the narrative that is being spun against you that hey you're becoming too big you're trampling over all these small guys and now i am not taking positions here because i have no you know way of knowing but the point is you have to tell your side of the story and all of these guys attempted to do, do that in some way and finally okay so you have data and numbers to back it up but what's your vision of the world what's your narrative of the world and how, where you fit in what's your big picture story so there is a big picture story about you that's being spun in the outside world but what's your take on it so that was a fourth element uh, yeah so th those were the four things that i thought uh, would be interesting for us to analyze them and maybe use in our own stories thanks ravi i mean you've been working with leaders now for you know quite a while do you think that there are some parts of storytelling that leaders in india find particularly challenging oh yeah uh <laughs> there is uh, you know uh, quite a bit actually so we find that uh, particularly you know when we have to share our own stories right we are good with the work story we are good with the yeah. organization story we are good with the uh, brand story but what about you what's in it for you why does this matter to you mm -hmm. uh, we are not that comfortable with the idea of vulnerability and yeah. opening ourselves up but you know this and we know this that people don't work for organizations alone people work for people and the face of the organization is also the leader so uh, the personal story is something that i in my work i find uh, leaders uh, some you know in india particularly uh, because india is a power distance culture it's a hierarchical culture and we feel comfortable talking about the world story but you know work is so important we derive a sense of identity for work uh, from work we derive a sense of success from work uh, so it's it's a reflection of where we are in culture and where we are in time but i think uh, it requires a lot of self assurance uh, yeah. to to tell a personal story yeah i i agree i completely agree i think it's really hard and i if i think back i think there are very few examples i can think of of people particularly in the corporate world i mean i may, might have heard a little more in say the impact world where people can connect what they're doing with you know the mission of the organization but i you know one will really have to think back to see the very few examples of people who have uh, the comfort with revealing a personal story and if i'm honest you know that same would hold for me as well i think i that's one area which i still haven't ventured quite <laughs> comfortably into i mean when we spoke last time one of the things you said uh, i found really really uh, really really interesting because in od we use it from another you know from a completely different direction the power of the stories we tell ourselves and how you work with people in you know them evolving the stories of themselves could you share a little bit about how you know how that works and and its sure. impact sure so since it's early days for storytelling in india a lot of storytelling often gets confused with uh, presentation skills uh, a lot of storytelling also gets confused with uh, oratory uh, and uh, you know public speaking etc but all of that is outer directed a large part of storytelling is not just outer directed but inner directed the story that we tell ourselves the story that we buy uh and that's what makes the story authentic because you know if you don't have belief in the story and if you're saying something else people can figure that out the message is not going to land uh but let me go a little deeper to explain the importance of this 
Uh, and let me try and do that through a story. We are talking about stories. Let me tell you a story. Um, this story uh, uh, concerns uh, uh, an athlete. It comes you know, from way back in time, 1938. There was a Hungarian athlete, uh, pistol shooter, champion pistol shooter called uh, Karoli Zatz. And Karoli wanted to represent his country. He was a sergeant in the army. And one day during regular army drill, a hand grenade exploded in his hand. And he woke up in a hospital with the hand gone. They had to amputate his hand. Uh, so, you know, those were those were not the days when we had inclusion and diversity policies, certainly not in the army. So your career is over. Your career as a pistol shooter is over. And, you know, that's the time when most of us would look up and ask that guy up there, why me? Why me? And why now? You know, when I was so close to achieving my goal, you know, uh, why not at age 90 uh, or why not, you know, if I had been born with that, I would have, you know, made peace with that. But why now? So he was asking himself these kind of questions and people would come to meet him at the hospital. They would console him and that would make him feel uh, much worse. Uh, I, I just like to reconfirm. Are you with me so far? Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah very clear. So uh, a couple of days later, he he just disappeared and people couldn't find him and they tried looking for him, but they couldn't find him. And then, you know, he goes to the forest and uh, uh, starts shooting, you know, with his left hand, a, a hand that he has never used in his life. And and he trains for a year and, uh, you know, comes back a year later to win the championship uh, in Hungary. But his dream to represent the country in Olympics remains just a dream because 1940, the World War happened. 1944, four years later, the World War still going on. 1948, he's lost 10 years. 1948, and you know, you know how important age is. 1948, he goes to the uh, Olympics after World War and he breaks the world record and establishes a new world record shooting with his left hand. 1952, he goes to the Olympics again and wins gold again. Now, you know, he, you know, I'm paraphrasing what he said. Yeah. Uh, and, and what he said was, when that happened, I had two choices. I could look at my at the hand that was not there and spend the rest of my life looking at the hand that was not there and asking myself, why me, why now? Or I could look at the other hand that was still there and you just need one hand to shoot a pistol. So, you know, it's a story to me that embodies this idea that what stories we tell ourselves, you know, they shape us, they make us. And uh, if you, you know, from a, from, a, from a behavioral perspective, if you were to look at where do actions come from? Our actions come from our belief systems. And where do belief systems come from? Our belief systems come from the stories we buy. Even a simple action, you know, when we touch somebody by mistake while walking, you know, by with, with our legs, what do we do? We bend down and touch the lower part of that body, that person's body to our head. Why do we do that? That action comes from a belief system that a God resides in everyone. And I have just touched a God with the lowest part of my body. So what do I do? I don't back off like in the Western system and say, hey, buddy, sorry. In fact, I lean forward. I bend and touch the lowest part of that God, that person's body and touch it back to my head so that these two gods are back in equilibrium. Now, where is that action coming from? That action comes from a belief system. And that belief system comes from a story that we buy into. So if you want to change actions, you have to change belief systems. And you have to change belief systems, you have to change the story. And that's where what story we buy into becomes very important. And as a leader, you know, when you when when you're very clear about that, because you know your decisions impact a lot of people. So it's it's very important what story uh, we tell ourselves. Then, I mean, as uh, you know, what advice would you give a leader on telling better stories to themselves personally? Two or three things that you think would be helpful for them to keep in mind. Uh, you know, this work is, it, at, at a leadership level, it becomes very deep work. And, uh, you know, first of all, you have to be very, very rooted and self-assured and realistic and be aware of the responsibility of a leader as to, you know, how many lives depend on you and the and the, and the burden that you carry as a leader. Uh, leadership is uh, not an opportunity to lead. A lot of people look at leadership uh, as a reward. 
what i mean by that is you know i have worked for 30 years and uh, i have risen through the ranks and i slogged and i gave the best part of my years to this company and now i have earned this reward it is not a reward it is an opportunity to serve you know that mindset you know again you know so what is the story are you seeing this if, if the story of of the elevation is that as a reward you got that story wrong so the story of leadership itself the story of leadership, leadership itself, itself it's not a reward so you know today the story of leadership a lot of people think of it as i served 30 years you know in this company i have risen through the ranks i have put my sweat and blood now is my time to sit in that cabin and now is my time to i have earned this reward it's not a reward it's an opportunity to serve this is now this is more difficult now this is this is not a reward for everything that you did in the past this is now you know about the future and and that's not going to be easy but it's a huge responsibility so that when you when you have clarity about the story of uh, leadership itself first of all that what story are you telling yourself of that leadership it starts from there so that's the first point that what is the story you are telling yourself about your elevation into that role and your role uh, as, as a leader so it starts there um, then i think it is about authenticity and uh, story is not about telling it is about doing it is about being it is about living that story because as a leader you are a platform you are elevated everybody is watching you uh, let me give an example you know, you can say everything at, the, at at an induction and you can have all of these big words on the walls, on the posters, on the elevators, in the conference rooms, etc. But values have to be in action. They have to be lived behavior. So the leader has to, you know, I say the story is not saying, story is doing. Uh, here's an example. Um, Narayan Murthy, uh, Infosys, uh, back in the days, wanted to send a message out that uh, we should... Uh, we should be cost conscious in the company and we should spend the company's money in a way that we, uh, as if it's our own money. Now, he could have sent a memo, but instead of that, what did he do? He started flying economy. He started now, you know, one of the richest guys, let this sink in. One of the richest guys in India flies economy. Uh, he has earned it, but that's not the story he is bought into. It is not about reward. He's saying, I, you know, I'm not asking you to do something that I can't do myself. So story has sense, to be sorry, I'm just going to just jump in a little. In a sense, you're speaking about living a story. Living a story. Yeah. And Being for real. a leader, living a story is obvious, is the most authentic and the most real part of storytelling. Absolutely. You know, two more stories very quickly. Ratan Tata, uh, he was on the way uh, uh, with his colleagues in a in a car on a long distance journey, and the car had a punctured tire. Most of us use uh, a brake uh, for a welcome smoke brake. Uh, men use it for a loo brake in the open. Uh, <laughs> so uh, he he was traveling with his senior colleagues, and they you know they took the opportunity to stretch. Uh, and have a smoke maybe and soon realized that Mr. Tata is nowhere to be found and they, they went looking for him. Guess where they found him? He was sitting, kneeling down on the road with the driver, sleeves rolled up, helping him change the tire. Values have to be lived and demonstrated. They are not to be put up on posters. No, that's that's another story. And Gandhi is the best example of that. Uh, he didn't say, you know, boycott British products. He wove, it, or he didn't only say boycott British products. He wore khadi woven on his own charkha by his own hands. You know, he traveled third class uh, with the common man. And he didn't say, go uh, break the break the salt rule and I'm there watching. He took the lati on his head. You know, in Indian Army, the casualty rate for officers is really high. And that's because our officers lead from the front. That's what Gandhi was doing. He took the first blow of lati on his head. So leadership is action. It's not uh, action over words, deeds over words. No, I completely agree with you. In fact, uh, if you want to judge any organization's culture, the place to start is the stories which are being told about how hmm. things actually work here. Uh, what people have said in a formal forum is pretty much irrelevant, to be honest. Yeah, okay. It's what are people who work for that organization really saying about it. 
And particularly, what are they saying about you know the critical incidents when there was a dilemma and actually a choice to be made? What choice did that organization or that leader make? And that's really the most uh, the most uh, powerful you know way of speaking out your your values by living them. But isn't there though a little bit of a difference between living your story, which of course people who know you who have an opportunity to observe you, like people who work in your organizations too, and storytelling in a more communicative fashion. Uh, like, for instance, uh, you know, as uh, Ravi spoke about, you know, how he observed leaders in one very small context, which is, you know, the antitrust hearing, where, uh, you know, it wasn't like working for Microsoft or, you know, for Google and looking at the leader, but uh, watching what they said in a particular forum and a particular context. Uh, so isn't that a difference between truly living your story? And obviously, that's the most yeah. powerful way of communicating your story for your organization and for people who are going to know you for a period of time. And storytelling in, say, a more uh, a, you know, specific context like this one, where communicating your story becomes, you know, uh, uh, the more, shall I say, important part. So I'm wondering, Ravi, if you have any uh, suggestions for any of our viewers and me as well, you know, how we can all become better storytellers. Absolutely, Shanini. And a great story, right? The story is by Amin. So, uh, you know, one way to kind of build on what he said uh, and to kind of answer your question also. So a good leader needs to ensure that the story he is telling and not just, of course, the story is also doing, but story that leaders also tell stories is in alignment with, I would say, three variables or three parts, moving parts, whatever name you want to call them. And so one variable or one moving part is the leader himself, his identity, his beliefs, his actions, his thoughts. And as Amin is rightly saying that you know, there are many leaders who will say something at a forum, but they don't do that. They do something else. And then that immediately makes them not a good storyteller. Unfortunately, the word storytelling gets a bad rep because of folks like this, because they say, Are, kahani mat suna, numbers batao. <laughs> or, you know, I, we know this, he's just spinning a story, he's just doing rhetoric. And politicians do this. We, have, we know some business leaders also who do this. So I think yeah. that is one important, uh, you know, uh, access to align your story to. The other two important axes for me are uh, you also need to align it to your audience. Yeah. And so uh, if the first one is to be authentic, the second one is to be empathetic. You need to know who is your audience. Where are they coming from? What are their fears, their challenges, their emotional reactions? Also, how easy or difficult will they find to understand what you're telling them? You know, forget about every day. We are not dealing with highly emotional stuff, right? Regular everyday communication. It's just passing on data and information from one person to the other. And probably I don't, I'm not going to react emotionally to your data, but my barrier is not emotional problem. It's just your data is too complex. You're not simplifying the story to me. So a good storyteller will be empathetic to the understanding ability of the audience and then say, hey, I've got a ton of stuff, but here is how I'm making it simple and easy for you to understand. And then I'll also, of course, you know, keep in mind your emotional reaction. So the empathy angle is also about, you know, knowing what is the logical and the emotional barriers that will be coming in your audience's mind to kind of understand something. And the third angle or the third uh, axis is the data itself, the truth. You know, uh, you may be authentic in believing something. So let's say there is a, a social uh, impact leader who authentically or very truly believes that X is the right way of doing something. But the data, the actual underlying data does not support that belief. In that case also, I think it's not a great story. So it's a tough, it's not an easy ask, but that's the, the, uh, the right, uh, you know, balance of, you know, being aligned on your own story, authenticity, uh, on your audience's reaction, empathy, and the truth, uh, or the clear, comprehensive truth. So th that's one, you know, three things that need to be done. And I'll give you just one simple tip on uh, the empathy part, right? So there's a very simple, nice storytelling tip called show, don't tell. If you're telling me that you are an innovative company, that you really value innovation, don't tell it to me. Tell me a story, show a story, a visual story where you have actually acted in a way that, you know, values innovation. Uh, so uh, an example that comes to mind um, is this uh, newsletter by this, uh, you know, company called The Ken. 
So every Saturday they release a newsletter called Nutgraph, and I'm a big fan of it because they they go deep and dive into fairly complicated topics and try and explain it, and not just explain it, but also tell us what will be the implication for us in 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 our daily life. So for example, when the the Geo big launch happened, I loved the way they analyzed, you know, how Geo was building a very unique company. So the uh, the the story that struck me was the one that happened last Saturday. So every Saturday it comes out, and uh, this was about uh, there's this new you know AI uh, revolution that's happened uh, by this company called OpenAI, which is called GPT three. Uh, and I'm not I'm not tech geek, so I don't understand what GPT three means. But I know that it's a revolution in the sense that now it's able to write stuff almost like humans, and that's freakish. It's able to code. It's able to write. and so the the future is coming closer and closer and so this guy uh, the nutgraph guy praveen gopal krishnan was writing the story of gpt3 and he's you know going into the details so he writes a beautiful intro about gpt3 uh, and then he goes into the nuts and bolts of you know okay what happened you know who used it how did it happen and all of this is happening and in the end he just writes a you know a brilliant line where he says you know guys this uh, was so intriguing that i wanted to try and see if i can use it myself so i applied and i got through permission to use gpt3 for myself and i've actually used this in this very piece you know how go back and read the first 200 words the intro piece that you liked so much that was not written by me it was written by gpt3 you know and so instead of yeah, saying sorry. that you know gpt3 is innovative he showed it to us it's, it's a show don't tell moment so that's uh, you know one one powerful tip that i thought i could you know share with the listeners Sorry, no, uh, that Sasha. just reminded me of uh, so my co-founder Jaspreet in his book uh, Tech Whisperer. He has hmm. a chapter which is written by AI. The book is about. <laughs> oh my God! This technology. is the future is already here. The robots are taking our jobs. So that was. <laughs> it's scary. It's scary stuff. So, Uh, I'm going to ask one last question. I mean, and anyone who is listening, and if you have any questions, uh, please do post them, and I'll ask them on your behalf. I mean, is there anything that you could share around? You know, if any of us want to be better storytellers, two or three easy takeaways for us. Sure. Uh, first, uh, the point that I had already covered, which is live your story, uh, right. so that it's all. when your actions are in alignment with your beliefs and when your beliefs are in alignment with your value system right so when what you say is aligned with what you do and what you do is aligned with your belief systems the story will be authentic number 2 uh, remember the best story uh, about shalini is not the one shalini tells herself but the one that ravi tells me about shalini or the one that jaspreet tells me about shalini so we live in the word of mouth economy and uh, uh today it's the, it's a review economy you know if i have to join an organization first i'll go to glassdoor and i'll see what people are saying about you know if i have to go and book a hotel i will not book a hotel but i will say what are other people saying about that hotel that's why we go to tripadvisor if you have to take a cab so fix your story there it's not about what you say but what others are already saying about you so your story is in play and others your customers are in charge of your story already so uh, look for alignment there look for al- alignment within point number 1 look for alignment outside are your stakeholders aligned with what you're saying uh, that's point number 2 number 3 i haven't seen a good storyteller worth his or her salt who's not a great listener uh, in my book storytelling comes later st- listening comes first if you're not a great listener you know you can't be a good storyteller forget it uh, and listening is you know is tied into understanding like ravi was talking about empathy with your listeners what are their concerns uh, about understanding that then comes the point about articulation fourth so after these three you come to articulation and there it's not what it's not just what we say but also how we say it that makes a lot of difference and in this articulation there's a huge uh, battery of techniques that you can learn uh, about how to frame something in a way that connects to people's hearts uh, but the simplest and the most powerful example that i can cite and close this uh a uh, story with is is the video that has gone viral on youtube it's called the power of words video where there's a blind man sitting and asking for money and he's got a play card there you know a cardboard on which he's written i am blind please help but that message that story is not working and people are passing by and he is using the magic words that we teach children right please help all of that i am blind please help and a lady comes and changes that she writes something else and magic happens and people are putting in money uh so later when that lady comes back 
he asks her, what did you do to my sign? And she says, I wrote the same thing, but in different words. And, and the camera zooms out and you see what's written there is, it's a beautiful day, but I can't see. Oh, that is powerful. So, so, you know, after you've checked for alignment on your story at three levels, internal, external, which is are your stakeholders and listening, comes articulation, which is very powerful. It's not what you say, but also how you say it. That makes a lot of difference. And that applies to numbers and data. That applies to your work story, your vision story, the organization story, the value story, uh, the change management story, uh, the inclusion and diversity. It's not what we say, but also how we say it. And like Ravi was saying, there are two parts to a story. I, I have always believed this truth well told. Now, to me, that's a good three word summary of storytelling. Truth well told. There are two parts to that. There's truth and well told. That guy was telling the truth. I am blind. Please help. What was missing was the well told. It's a beautiful story. I mean, that's a really beautiful story. And, you know, we really believe that storytelling is going to be much more important than ever in the past because the environment around us is changing so much that we need everybody is looking for something that ties it together and makes sense of it. You know, otherwise, uh, it's very difficult for uh, any of us, either in our individual capacity or, you know, in our organizational capacity to know what needs to happen. And uh, therefore, for leaders, being able to tell good stories becomes so important because it helps give perspective, a sense, a reason why something should or should not happen. Uh, and because the environment is changing so fast, therefore the ability to keep people aligned, you know, can no longer rest with just protocol or procedure or systems, which while very helpful, also play a role in slowing down action. So, you know, stories have this advantage that uh, on the one hand, they can give you immediate clarity on what's important and what's not. And at the same time, they don't really necessarily tie down your action you know in a very narrow band which is perhaps the reason why you know in all cultures of the world stories and particularly mythology and you know epics have played such an important role in while they're not prescriptive but they give you this broad canvas of you know what the big truths are and what are the grand rights and you know absolute wrong so i'm going to look at some of the questions so we have a question from Mayank, he asks, do we as storytellers focus more on failures or success? Ravi? Yeah. <laughs> no, I think uh -huh. both stories are important. Uh, but I think failure, as Amin was saying, failure teaches us more. Uh, success, so what do they say? Um, success has many fathers, but failure is an orphan, right? So failures teach us more. And uh, if especially leaders who otherwise have credibility in what they do if they share stories of their own failures i think that's a it's a great trait because it a shows them to be vulnerable to to be human to not be this you know demigod kind of a person that oh i've never made a mistake in my life and uh, more importantly it tells the others that hey it's okay it's okay to try and fail and uh, this is not a you know you'd be fired the, at the first mistake kind of a culture so I, I would kind of give a slightly more higher weightage to stories of failure. I think those are the ones that have more learning in them. Okay. Okay. So I, I think, uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I'm saying I agree with Ravi uh, completely. Uh, it's not the failure story, the success stories, which story is more important, uh, which authentic story is a uh, story is a tool, which, you know, it serves a purpose. So what's the purpose? And, you know, for certain purposes, you need success stories and certain purposes, you'll need failure stories. So start not with by looking within and saying, you know, OK, uh, I've got a failure story. Now I want to tell the world the failure. Story. <laughs> that's, that's the point. Yeah, because the moment you start doing it for the wrong reasons, that's the end of it. You know, uh, stories like uh, a story is not about spinning a yarn. Uh, I hate that word spin. Uh, it's about it's about conveying a message that people can connect with at a deeper level. And, and therefore, start with the purpose. Why would I use this tool? And if the purpose requires a success story, and they're, they're very important as well, 
go ahead and use a success story otherwise you know jungle mein mor nacha kisne dekha you know we live in an attention deficit economy who's who's got the time to figure out you know what good work you've done you have to make the effort of going and telling it Thank and you. in fact many companies kind of spend a lot of time creating these success story case studies right and the moment it is made as a case study you know with these boxes to be filled i think it completely takes away the story element of it i think that there's a lot of potential to really make those come out alive as a story so yeah i think uh, great point amin yeah sorry shan go ahead no thank you thank you i realize that we are at the end of our time <laughs> uh, for me actually leaving uh, our conversation today some of the things which really stand out is one the best stories are truth well told i thought yeah. that was really really powerful and bring both together i think uh, some of the things which we spoke about uh, about you know stories having and i think ravi you alluded to it in 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 the way you spoke about how leaders told their stories the whole piece of logic data coming together with yeah. having an emotional impact and right. that coming together as being a very powerful uh, you know so i if so my big takeaways are both the truth well told and which is actually almost the same thing but you know yeah, having <laughs> having the logic the data etc along with an emotional connect in you know the way it is told is really seems to be at the heart of creating a story which has impact and that's a very very uh, that's a beautiful takeaway for all of us thank you so much thank you amin thank you ravi thank you so much for thank being you. with us today thank, thank you. you for the for a lovely conversation and uh, for bringing me and ravi uh, on on the same platform uh I'm, i'm a big admirer of the work he does thank you so much anil it was great fun i learned a lot thank you thank you thank you so thank you everyone for joining us uh, do stay with us for our episode next week on independence day we have the legend himself mr gurcharan das joining us to talk about how do we build a better india and i mean i can't think of a better person on a better day for that conversation so please do join us um a recording of our conversation today will be available on my linkedin profile right after otherwise follow us at uncube on linkedin twitter and this particular conversation will be on our website by monday uh with that thank you very much have a nice weekend and see you next week